Hello, everyone. Hello, Prof. Good evening. Can you hear me? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? My voice is clear. Good. Good evening, Prof. Leo. Christopher, good evening. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello, Christopher. Good evening. Ah, wait, I can't hear you. Let me just sort something out. Christopher, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Christopher? Christopher? Walaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Christopher, can you hello? hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear us? Oh dear, I can't hear you. Um, very strange. Uh, maybe, hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. I can't hear you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll send you an email. Email.
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear us? Oh, I can hear you now. <laughs> oh, great. Fantastic. What was the problem, Christopher? Thank you. Because uh, I'm actually, uh, I've had to come to London. So uh, I've had to move my computer and instead of using my usual speakers, uh, I had to change the setting ah. to these, my, uh, my headphones. I see. Exactly, exactly. Good evening, Christopher, and good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, do you like to test your uh, uh, screen or your presentation to share it now before sure. we start? Mm -hmm. Please. Okay, it's uh, disabled at the moment. So um, if, um, if the host could um, enable screen sharing for me. Yeah, done. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> It's all gimmick and no substance. <laughs> very nice, thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully Nancy will join us in a couple sure. of minutes. Yeah. How is the weather in London today? It's not bad. It's about 14 degrees and um, good sunshine. Mm -hmm. Nice. How about you? Um, let's say it is uh, an early summer, still not mm -hmm. that hot. But uh, uh, at night, the weather is nice. But during the day, it's, it's hot, relatively hot. Yes. Is it like 30 something? Um, yes, 35 plus. Okay. I'll message Nancy. Mm -hmm. Hopefully she, she has no technical issue. Mm. Hello, Nancy. Hi, Dr. Du, how are you? How are you? Looking forward. Welcome. Welcome, Nancy. How are you today? Alhamdulillah. Ahlan wa Great. I think now we can start because it is uh, one minute past 10. Okay, great. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Christopher Liu from the UK. Christopher Liu is a consultant of cornea, external eye disease, and cataract in Brighton at the Sussex Eye Hospital. He is a world-leading expert in the osteoodontokeratoprosthesis, OOKP. He also serves as an honorary clinical professor and undergraduate ophthalmology lead for the Brighton and Sussex University. 
He is a multi-award winner, and he was appointed OBE in 2018 for services to ophthalmology. I'd like to thank Christopher for accepting the invitation to give the opening lecture of the cornea series. It is a great honor to have him on board. I would like to welcome Dr. Nancy Arraqad, the head of cornea specialty at the Royal Medical Services of Jordan. And I want to thank her for letting us know Professor Liu and for arranging this cornea series with Professor Liu and Professor Mohammed Husni from Egypt. Welcome Christopher and welcome Nancy. Dear ladies and gentlemen, the rocket is about to land on the Wonderland. We are all excited to hear from Christopher an overview of the Wonderland before landing. Christopher, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the very kind invitation and introduction. So today is an overview. So nothing in too much detail, uh, but a bit of this and a bit of that uh, uh, of other things to make it all uh, fits together. The title of my talk, an overview uh, to the Wonderland. Declaration of interest. Um, I do run a private practice, uh, but I'm not paddling for patients. So here we have our Wonderland. And um, this is a picture from Alice in Wonderland. And you can see all these magic mushrooms, which can for sure take you uh, on trips. And here is the castle, which my wife, uh, when she saw it, she says, well, I want to live here, right here. But look around, what else do you see? Do you see this little creature here? We might be coming back to him. Mm -hmm. So the cornea is a true wonder. And I first became interested in a career in ophthalmology when I became short-sighted, age 13. Well, of course, I'm no longer short-sighted as I had LASIK in 2002. When I went into ophthalmology, I decided I don't really like looking or peeping through holes like the pupil. So I chose the cornea as a subspecialty. I thought it would be nice and easy it, as it was so small, just one centimeter in diameter and appeared to have no structure. Then I found out that it's a little bit more complicated and it took me years to understand the clinical science and surgery of the cornea. And in the next hour, I want to share some of my understanding with you to uh, help you, I hope it will be of some help, to put everything together. Now the cornea forms parts of the ocular surface. And uh, as I said, um, I want to show you uh, so uh, you can see uh, the whole picture. I just want to start with a little bit of philosophy in terms of knowledge, experience and mentorship. Knowledge can be learned from a variety of sources, but correct application of knowledge is equally important. Experience cannot be gained without immersion and the passage of time. You can learn more quickly, but uh, you would need to reflect on your practice, especially after treating challenging cases and cases which have not gone as well as you would like them to have gone. Having a trainer and mentor helps immensely as they can direct your development. It is then the matter of learning how to use the knowledge rather than just learning the knowledge, uh, which all of us uh, are supposed to do lifelong. Let's have a little revision of the anatomy of the cornea. You're all familiar with the different layers. So we have here the uh, epithelium, which is stratified squamous, non-keratinizing, except in disease. And the cells come from the limbus uh, inwards and then uh, outwards uh, towards the uh, wing cells and it eventually gets shed off uh, with blinking. The stroma you know about, and the stroma has keratocytes, but also it has a Bowman's layer, and more recently discovered there is a predecimase layer uh, or Dewar's layer, which is mechanically very, very strong. Dewar's layer does not carry any keratocytes. Dewar's layer can be uh, separated from the rest of the stroma, uh, forming a sort of big bubble, 
and equally decimase membrane can be separated uh, from Dewar's layer forming another sort of big bubble. Then you have decimase membrane, which you can consider to be a carrier of the corneal endothelium, which is in a healthy state, hexagonal in shape, because that actually um, represents the lowest entropy or the most stable states of cells. Now in the human cornea, the endothelium does not normally divide, although it can be stimulated to do so in very rare circumstances. Now, the ocular surface of which the cornea uh, is part of depends on a number of things. Firstly, the lid margins, they should be normal and there should be a normal blink bringing the lid margins together and wiping the cornea, uh, replenish it, it with a new tear film uh, and also uh, wiping away debris and dead cells from the surface. And you can see that the conjunctiva uh, extends not just from the bulbar parts, but into the recess uh, onto the tarsal as well. And here are reservoirs uh, for tears. The tear film itself is very, very complicated. It has itself several layers, but it is in fact a sort of a gel. It, it um, behaves as a gel. And then you have the limbal stem cells, which you will see. And this is where the corneal cells, corneal epithelial cells um, start from. And they live there and they are really quite patient and only divide very, very infrequently. Sensation is also important. So innervation of the cornea, which is uh, reduced in some rare congenital conditions uh, and also uh, with uh, herpetic and zoster disease, uh, the uh, sensation can be much reduced and the corneal epithelium is not so healthy and heals not as well. Of course, you can have denovation. Uh, you can see the normal plexus here uh, from surgery that we do as well, uh, be it um, PRK, LASIK smile, um, penetrating keratoplasty, uh, deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Always there will be damage to the nerves and they take months uh, to recover. So you can see here where we've got a tear film, we've got blink, we've got meibomian glands, which we will come to. We've got a main lacrimal gland. We have accessory lacrimal glands uh, all over the place. And we've got a drainage system and a lacrimal sac, which uh, pumps uh, the, and sucks away the tears uh, with each blink. And of course we've got nerve supply, blood supply, uh, endocrine uh, modification uh, of the environment, and of course, uh, immune response as well. Now this slide is actually very important. I know we deal with curing and treating diseases, but actually prevention is much better than cure. So what are we talking about? Look, if people are malnutrition, then they may have uh, uh, dry eyes from vitamin A and malnutrition, compared, uh, sorry, uh, combined with uh, some viral condition can be very, very dangerous uh, and cause corneal melts and so on. Now, how about clean water? That is also very important uh, in prevention trachoma. So you need clean water and clean hand and face hygiene up to uh, reduce the risk of glaucoma because this is due to repeated infection uh, causing scarring uh, and uh, keratinization and also scarring of the cornea. Now, what about those uh, people who wear contact lenses? Hygiene is ever so important and uh, we must instruct um, contact lens wearer not to wear the lenses when they take a shower or swim. And uh, because it would put them uh, at risk of acanth amoeba, which we'll talk about a little bit in a moment. Eye protection in terms of um, goggles and wet round glasses, they protect from physical injury, uh, chemical injury, and uh, at work, uh, at home, during leisure, for example, uh, when playing uh, sports, and also DIY when you're trying to build a cupboard, what have you. So uh, damages like this uh, can be avoided and should be avoided. And suddenly uh, we will have uh, less work to do, to less patients to worry about, and less blindness. Now, 
Also, early diagnosis, aggressive treatment of blind diseases such as Stevens Johnson syndrome and mucous membrane pemphigoid, also are important uh, because it reduces uh, the eventual uh, risk of uh, risk of eventual corneal blindness. Finally, beware of misuse and side effects of medications. So steroid, I will really uh, lay on to people about uh, the misuse of steroids uh, throughout the next um, 40 or 45 minutes. Patients may be uh, abusing uh, and with anesthetic as well. Uh, inappropriate use of antibiotics can breed um, resistance and uh, cause uh, toxicity. And very importantly, preservatives, which um, are um, present uh, in all drops except for unpreserved drops, they will damage your ocular surface. So let's have a look at the first group of diseases, nephritis and uh, dry eye. They really form a continuum. You can't separate one from the other. And whilst it can be uh, very, very complicated and complex, it is also possible to look at uh, this uh, spectrum in a more uh, simplified view, and which is what I'm going to share with you now. So let's have a look at anterior and posterior blepharitis. And they are distinct diseases, but they can coexist, and both can coexist with demodex infestation. Here you see a typical picture of anterior blepharitis with crusting at the lash base and around lashes and inflammation of the lid margin and eventually uh, uh, losing the lashes as well. So they have a foreign body sensation and a dry eye uh, symptom. And of course, um, bugs um, can live uh, in uh, these um, crusts and uh, form um, some um, chemicals which uh, irritate the eye as well. And also equally, um, it can be a source of uh, bacteria for um, post uh, phaco endophthalmitis. So the management actually is quite simple. It's all summarized here. Lid hygiene, uh, which can be um, with commercially available wipes. And I favor that, although it is costly. Otherwise, you can make up solutions yourself with uh, baby shampoo or bicarbonate of soda diluted with cool boiled water, uh, followed by rinsing off with cool boiled water. Now, you can decrease the bacterial load with uh, one month's worth of bedtime chloramphenicol ointment. You can give um, artificial tears uh, to keep the eyes comfortable. Uh, but very importantly, uh, one must explain to the patient that this is a chronic condition. Do not expect a cure. They will forever have to clean their uh, lid margins. And if they want to take a break, expect that the symptoms will uh, return and they will have to start again. So that's anterior blepharitis in a nutshell. What about posterior blepharitis, uh, also known as uh, meibomian band dysfunction or MGD? Essentially, this is an alteration in the myboom gland secretion uh, and a blockage of the ducts and forming lid cysts and associated with uh, acne, uh, rosacea, and because uh, of uh, lack of um, the uh, oily layer or unstable oily layer, there will be a decreased uh, tear breakup time and equally there will be uh, evaporation uh, of the aqueous part of the tear film uh, causing dryness and hyperosmolality. So management is with diet and a hot compress. Uh, usually the best ones are the commercially available uh, small pillows, uh, which can be microwaved. There are steam goggles as well, and uh, massage to uh, empty out the myboma secretions is important. Uh, and uh, there are some dry eye clinics which specialize uh, in uh, such massage treatments. And you can see a commercial uh, a commercially available uh, lippy flow um, that massages the lid and also people uh, sell uh, intense uh, pulse light therapy and so on. But usually we don't really need to go to such extremes. Now, if um, the simple measures do not work, then tetracycline uh, or group of tetracycline medications should work, but you have to wait six to eight weeks before the beneficial effects kick in. The commonly used ones are doxycycline and limecycline. 
And they are, of course, firstly an antibiotic, but they also have anti-inflammatory effects and uh, they uh, alter mybomium um, secretion uh, to uh, soften them uh, and uh, to make way uh, for oils to come through later on. And again, these patients may need artificial tears and an explanation that it is a chronic condition and they have to accept that it needs to be managed and cannot will not go away. So here's our friend uh, in that um, Alice in Wonderland landscape. And here you can see this is, of course, um, a demodex mite. And you can see that it's got four pairs of legs, <clears throat> which means it is not an insect. OK, so uh, these slides are courtesy of uh, Mehran and uh, only demodex folliculorum and uh, demodex brevis are found in the human body and the folliculorum inhabits hair follicles of eyelashes, and the brevis lives deep in the meibomium glands and the sebaceous glands uh, of the lash. And here is the front and back uh, of a demodex mite. The symptoms are nonspecific, uh, and changing ophthalmological symptoms report, reported by patients infected with demodex may result from varied mechanisms of the pathological impacts of demodex on the eye. There will be individual variation uh, in response to the same degree of infestation. Uh, it is similar to skin test of house dust mite as an allergen. And as with many anterior ocular disorders, symptoms can be similar and may not uh, always be present. So the diagnosis uh, is not easy. There has also been a report of reduced corneal sensation as a result of demodex uh, infestation. So these are the possible um, symptoms, and you can see that's why I say nephritis, dry eye, uh, and uh, related disease, they all give you this sort of thing. Uh, irritation, gritty eyes, itching, uh, eyelid redness, subjective lash loss, uh, real lash loss, um, watery eyes, pain, and the presence of pus, uh, which actually is not very usual, but can be present. So the diagnosis is uh, based on the longevity of the symptoms and lack of clinical response to conventional blepharitis treatment. Now, here's a very useful sign. It's a cylindrical cuff or cylindrical dandruff of the eyelash. And this is said to be pathognomic uh, of uh, demodex-induced uh, blepharitis. There is also published evidence that demodex is associated with a large number of skin diseases, as you can see here. Demodex infestation can still be detected in half the patients despite daily lid scrub with baby shampoo uh, uh, scrubbing for over a year. So the um, main treatment, topical treatment, is with tea tree oil or extract uh, or uh, the active chemical parts of tea tree oil uh, uh, local application. And these have anti-mites, antibacterial, antifungal, and anti-inflammatory effects. There are a number of commercially available uh, lid wipes which contain a tea tree oil extract uh, or a particular a chemical within uh, the uh, tea tree oil. Now, stronger TTO, tea tree oil, has direct killing uh, effect on the mites, whereas the weaker solution may interrupt the life cycle uh, by preventing them uh, making babies. So th there is weekly uh, office lid scrub with a um, stronger one followed by daily home lid scrub, or you can just use the weaker one over a longer period. So now let's uh, move on to the dry eye. Now you can study dry eye for your whole life. And indeed, if you look at this beautiful diagram from uh, Christophe Baudouin's um, publication in the BJO in 2016, you can see that this is your eye and this is your um, meibomium gland that you can have obstruction and uh, hyperkranization and so on and so forth. You can study all this, but essentially these are the uh, factors. You have aqueous deficiency, not enough um, tears being made. There can be uh, evaporation, uh, due to um, a poor or uh, poor quality um, oily layer. And then you, uh, after evaporation uh, or just the way the tears are produced, there's hyperosmolality. And also there's always inflammation. 
uh, in a dry eye situation. And remember, signs may not match level of symptoms, so you can have a quiet looking eye, but the um, symptoms may be very severe. And you can look at uh, epithelial staining as evidence, and you can also look at tear breakup time or TBUT. So what can we do about um, dry eyes? So again, a simplified view for you, obviously treat any significant blepharitis uh, that they must remember to blink fully and that the uh, people must take time away from screen and they must not have a blower uh, on uh, their face like when they're driving uh, or air conditioning, uh, they can wear some glasses to uh, reduce evaporation as well. But unpreserved artificial tears usually hyaluronic acid unpreserved uh, is the mainstay uh, of um, creating comfort. And you can increase the frequency and increase the thickness uh, of the tears to become gel. But of course, gel and thicker tears will um, make uh, for blurred vision. So it is a balance as to what creates comfort and what creates um, a sustained good vision for them. Sometimes they need to use an ointment at night so hyaluronite, for example, which is some vitamin A inside as well. Now, if you decide that um, the frequency of using artificial tears is really uh, too frequent, then you could consider uh, using uh, punctum plugs, usually to the lower lids first. Now, it is said that uh, to switch off inflammation, you should use a short course of topical steroid for two weeks before inserting the plugs, otherwise, you're putting the plugs in and uh, you are keeping the inflammatory uh, soup uh, on the ocular surface. If this is insufficient, then you can consider uh, plugging the upper uh, lids as well, upper lid puncta, uh, but also uh, if you prefer, and it's uh, for sure that the uh, dry eye will be long-term, you can also do the punctal occlusion by cautery. Now, some people uh, need to stay on uh, a weak long-term steroid, you know, one drop, two drops a day uh, for discomfort. In terms of cyclosporine, I have not really uh, found that uh, useful. So here are some tips on uh, punctual occlusion. Now, with plugs, uh, the size does matter. If it's too small, then uh, it will fall out, or worse still, uh, it will fall in, and then you can't find it, uh, and then it acts as a foreign body within the canaliculus and can cause infection. When you are dilating uh, with this end uh, of the uh, punctum plug, then do not over dilate. Uh, it should just be big enough uh, for this bit to go in, and this bit should be on the surface. And when it becomes soiled, then replace it. Now, if you're considering cautery, then uh, of course you will have a wire which goes very, very hot, it forms a loop. So if you squeeze the loop together for ease of entry uh, into the canaliculus, and then you take it out again, sorry, and then you test it, you test it for heat, and you also burn off any debris uh, on the hot wire. Now, when you wait for it to cool down and you insert it cold into the uh, lower canaliculus, and then you warn the patient that uh, they will smell some uh, burning, but please not to move. And of course, you must have given them adequate local anesthesia so that they don't feel anything. So it sizzles and then you let it cool and then you pull it out and it will rip out uh, uh, the epithelium uh, from the lining and it should close quite nicely and hopefully close for at least one or two years or longer. Remember, after burning, uh, it can still reopen, especially uh, if the technique uh, was not very good. Let's move on to uh, another storyline, that of um, infection. And I know this will be covered in detail, so I will just um, do a little bit, uh, but I will do a little bit more uh, on fungal keratitis. The risk factors uh, of uh, infective keratitis are contact lens wear, ocular surface disease, trauma, and long-term topical steroids. In terms of contact lens wear, the safest contact lenses are rigid gas permeable contact lenses. They're safer than soft lenses. And daily wear, meaning not wearing overnight, is much safer than extended wear, which means keeping them in overnight. We've already mentioned that showering or swimming with contact lenses in place 
uh, is a, a hazard for catching acanthamoeba. However, if you're a contact lens wearer, you, you cannot completely avoid the risk of infection, uh, even with uh, exemplary uh, lens hygiene. Any bug can infect the cornea, so you have bacteria. So you hear here um, a Pseudomonas um, bacterium, uh, which is very devastating. It can um, make the uh, cornea perforate uh, within uh, a, a couple of days. You have um, fungus, you have amoeba, and many, many other agents. Now, what can we tell from the appearance? If we look at a corneal ulcer, can we tell what agent it is? Well, actually, no, clinical appearance is not reliable for et the etiology. However, if you see uh, in a non, especially in a non-contact lens wearer, only very, very small lesions, uh, maybe half a meter or so in the periphery and without any anterior chamber activity, then it is unlikely uh, to be uh, infective. Fungal keratitis may have feathery edges and satellite lesions. Radiokeratinuritis is said to be pathognomic of acanthamoeba keratitis. So you see here that the uh, ra radial nerve has been, <coughs> and here as well, infiltrated uh, by uh, cells, uh, which make them uh, more visible. Now, herpes uh, simplex keratitis can mimic uh, anything and is very much overdiagnosed. So please be very careful of not um, calling everything herpes, which I see uh, around me, uh, it happens a lot. So in one slide, let's see what we do uh, in, in, as an approach to bacterial uh, keratitis. So uh, especially in the contact lens where you must scrape for microscopy culture and sensitivity, a gram stain can give an instantaneous clue as to what the agent might be. And if you are planning to treat round the clock with hourly uh, topical antibiotic drops, then don't expect patients to be able to manage unless there is somebody dedicated to put the drops in for them and they will still get very tired. So if possible, admit the patient uh, into a bay or even better, a single room uh, and a nurse can put the drops in. And you start with a monotherapy, usually a fluoroquinolone. Do not expect changes of clinical um, appearance, clinical improvements uh, before uh, 48 hours uh, of uh, treatment. Although the patient might tell you that their eye uh, is, has become more comfortable even before then. If no response, then consider rescrape. And usually a rescrape means that you'll have to stop the antibiotics for a little while and let the bugs uh, waken up a little bit uh, and then uh, rescrape for uh, further culture. Or you can step up empirically uh, to uh, double treatment with fortified uh, cafeoxium and gentamicin and so on. What about the approach to acanthamoebic keratitis? Again, just on one slide, remember high index of suspicion uh, and um, people say that there could be disproportionate pain. There may or may not be that. The first thing really is the epithelium becomes uh, quite irregular and then there are infiltrates at different depths. Radiokeratinuritis we've talked about, confocal can help you uh, identify uh, cysts. Uh, and then what do you do then? You take off the uh, epithelium as a sheet of cells and divide that half for microscopy and half for culture. And the culture would be on E. coli seeded non-nutrient agar. Early diagnosis hugely improves outcome. Uh, it is often misdiagnosed as herpes simplex and the delayed diagnosis and um, initial use of steroid uh, all make the likelihood of a, a poor outcome much more likely, uh, including uh, having to uh, do um, corneal grafting. And uh, if at all possible, that is to be avoided. So treatment is uh, monotherapy. And uh, again, I see people uh, using several uh, compounds, but really you just need a PHMB. That is the best, is uh, cysticidal, and you hit it hard. Uh, and then you ease off and then you stop a bit uh, and then you go back on again when the uh, cysts have hatched into trophocytes. And remember, no steroids 
In acanth amoeba, the only uh, two conditions when you're forced to use steroid is when there is a rip roaring iritis uh, or scleritis. Uh, if you go to this, uh, you hear a discussion uh, by um, Professor John Dart uh, at a recent uh, AAO meeting. So I want to go uh, into a little bit more detail uh, with uh, fungal keratitis and these slides courtesy of uh, Steve Tuft. So you see here, we have the uh, filaments and the yeast, and you can see uh, names which are familiar with uh, Aspergillus fusarium candida. And the uh, picture can be quite um, different. You, sometimes you get pigment, and here you see a loose suture, and this corneal graft has been on uh, topical steroid for a long time. So here, together with a break in the uh, epithelium, uh, allows um, uh, bugs to get in. You do need an epithelial defect before a fungus can get in, and it will multiply locally, and um, it forms toxins and pro proteolysis, uh, causing necrosis, and then it can spread. And it can invade decimase membrane, and the filamentary uh, fungi can penetrate intact decimase membrane and therefore can cause uh, endophthalmitis. And fungal keratitis is very much um, a, a tropical kind of disease. And when you go to temperate climates, the, um, the incidence is much less. So risk factors, contact lens wear, topical steroid use, which can give yeast infection, so candida, uh, trauma or corneal surgery, uh, chronic ocular surface disease and gives you yeast again and travel to topical regions. So yeast, temperate climate, ocular surface disease, uh, after surgery and long-term steroid and mold, tropical following trauma, especially agricultural and happens more in male. So diagnosis as usual, uh, history, examination and investigations. So you have direct imaging, uh, smear and culture, histopathology and PCR. PCR increases um, the um, sensitivity hugely. So um, assess for specific risk factors, uh, service disease like persistent epithelial defect, dry eye, topic steroid use, herpes simplex, contact lens wear, and previous surgery. Corneal smear, you can use a variety of stains. So gram, uh, the high fee would be in negative relief because it doesn't take up the gram stain. And then you have lectophenol cotton blue, uh, silver, and calcofluor white. Culture, you can use uh, blood agar with uh, an enrichment uh, media. It will grow. And then you have uh, sabrodextrose agar as well. And of course, it takes longer to culture compared with bacteria. Confocal, here you see um, a fusarium solenei um, plaque on the contact lens wearer. Uh, and uh, you, you can see uh, the uh, hyphae. Biopsy, so how do you take a biopsy? Biopsy can be part of your penetrating keratoplasty if you need to do that in order to contain the fungus. But also if you just wanna take a small bit, then you can take a small bit. Sometimes you have to take a small bit from the posterior layer as well. And then uh, you can um, stain it to see. PCR. Uh, as I said, uh, the sensitivity is much better compared with culture and smear, and you can uh, look it up at um, www.micropathology.com. So the treatment algorithm, diagnosis, empirical treatment, so your superficial infection, uh, you would debride the lesion and try natamycin, uh, and then if no response, add chlorhexidine, and these are the alternatives. If it's a deep stromal, uh, infection and risk of endophthalmitis, then uh, you use uh, natamycin combined with chlorhexidine and give oral voriconazole, and you have the option of uh, intralesional and intracameral voriconazole as well. And if necessary, excisional uh, biopsy uh, to look at what it is, uh, sorry, to, to remove it uh, and uh, do a therapeutic keratoplasty. So uh, uh, if the culture is out, is not so important because you cannot um, really rely on um, sensitivity, unlike bacterial antibiotic sensitivity, it's not so reliable uh, for fungus. But in general, if it's yeast, then uh, you can use amphotericin. And remember, amphotericin cannot go through, cannot get through intact epithelium. 
So on a daily basis, you have to remove epithelium for the amphotericin to gain uh, access to the stroma and uh, filaments, then you have these options. So management of inflammation, it's really important to stop topical steroid uh, and use uh, cyclosporin, uh, either topical uh, or systemic to control inflammation. Excisional keratoplasty, if you need to uh, excise uh, all the infection, then uh, remember to you keep a clear margin as well. So do it two millimeters larger than uh, what is obvious. And uh, you might have to remove the iris and the lens as well as necessary. Uh, and, and so on, and, and give some um, voriconazole. And remember to use intra-sutures, as in any keratoplasty on show, you need to do that. Otherwise, if one suture, if the suture becomes loose, then the whole thing comes off, it's, it's only one continuous suture. So the summary guidelines of fungal keratitis, uh, stop a topical steroid and debride, and try topical natamycin, topical chlorhexidine, oral for a console uh, if there is a risk of intraocular spread and early surgery uh, if progressing and use cyclosporin A for inflammation. Now, I really want to just say steroids should be used when they need to be used, but there are many occasions I see people uh, around me uh, just giving steroids as though they were sweets, and we do need to be very, very careful. So which are the conditions then? You actually know all the conditions, but just exercise restraints when you see these patients. Herpes simplex epithelial disease, you will convert um, linear disease uh, into geographic disease. Fungal keratitis, I told you about. Uh, acanthamoeba keratitis, we've talked about that. Pseudomonas, uh, even late on, pseudomonas can return like wildfire, so be very careful. The reality is that steroids um, do not change the end visual results in bacterial keratitis. So, so why bother to take a risk? And the reality is that the cornea has great ability to remodel itself uh, over months and years, uh, and its shape and clarity will improve with time. Viral keratitis. Uh, just a few slides. You've already had an excellent uh, talk uh, by Dr. Nancy al uh, a week or so ago. So viral keratitis is a common condition both in the developed and developing world and herpes simplex keratitis is the commonest cause of corneal blindness in the developed world uh, and it is devastating when combined with malnutrition and co-infection in the de developing world accounting for up to 60% of corneal ulcers in the developing world. So here are the DNA and uh, RNA viridis, and really we're just going to talk about these ones very quickly uh, in red text. HFV, HSV, you've already heard about in the uh, previous talk. It's a member of the herpes family and it is ubiquitous uh, human pathogen causing both uh, asymmetric infections and active diseases in a wide variety of end organs, the eye being one. And humans are the only natural host. And you uh, are familiar with this icosahedral shape, capsid, uh, which surrounds the core uh, containing linear double-stranded DNA. Basically, it's epitheliotropic, uh, but may become uh, neurotropics. Well, then two types, uh, the type one being usually above the umbilicus and type two usually uh, below um, the umbilicus, although they can cross territory. So most of presentation, uh, primary uh, infection in lips, cornea and uh, genitalia, latency, the virus is incorporated into host DNA where it persists indefinitely. So herpes is for life and recurrence may be triggered by ultraviolet intercurrent illness and decreased immunity. And remember, for those with decreased immunity, you do need more aggressive treatments. Uh, otherwise, uh, they, it can spread and can be very dangerous. Um, so congenital and neonatal ocular herpes, here are a couple of clinical pictures. So the periocular skin lesion can be affected. Uh, you can have conjunctivitis, epithelial stromal keratitis, uh, cataracts and necrotizing chororetinitis as well. 
primary ocular herpes, you can see a picture here, usually occurs in childhood and is spread by droplet transmission uh, and due to protection by the maternal antibody, it is uncommon to see this condition during the first six months of life. Mostly the infection is subclinical, of course, mild fever, malaise, and uh, upper respiratory tract infection. And the ocular manifestation includes act, uh, acute uh, follicular conjunctivitis, character conjunctivitis with lymphadenopathy and periocular and eyelid skin lesions. So I just need to remind you that, of course, there are other causes of follicles. Uh, for example, it is natural to follicles uh, in children. Uh, it can happen in adenal virus and uh, molluscum uh, and some contact lens uh, solution allergy as well. So with recurrent disease, there's epithelial disease, stromal disease, endothelial disease, and there can be loss of sensation, um, neurotrophic keratopathy, uh, iris atrophy, and the canalicula can, can also be scarred uh, giving rise to watering eyes. Now, when you're looking at epithelial disease, there's typical dendritic pattern, uh, you look for end bulbs. So it is not just linear, it's got a bulb at the end. And before, when we had rose bangle stain, these bulbs would actually stain particularly. So it is a clinical diagnosis, you can debride or you can use topical acyclovir or gansyclovir, oral treatment not usually indicated and certainly no steroid. Differential diagnosis, uh, zoster, uh, healing abrasion, uh, acanthamoeba, and toxic keratopathy. Necrotizing stroma disease. Uh, we have heard this uh, from uh, Dr. Nancy, so I'm not actually going to uh, elaborate on this in the interest of time. Disciform, this is due to attack on the endothelium, and disciform means it looks like a coin or a disc, and where the attack is going on, uh, the endothelium doesn't work and the uh, cornea swells up in that area uh, and there are some small KPs and um, you treat it with steroid and antiviral and taper off gradually. So I think the tips for um, herpes simplex is that there are various um, head studies uh, carried out in America where they did not have uh, use of uh, topical acyclovir. So those studies were done uh, with oral acyclovir. And it's not really, um, therefore some of the results are not applicable uh, to where we can get uh, topical uh, acyclovir and topical gansyclovir. So oral antiviral is usually not indicated, but would be necessary for prevention of recurrence. So that usually would be 400 milligrams twice a day. And remember to check the uh, um, kidney function uh, every so often and beware of the immunocompromised because herpes uh, can kill in the immunocompromised. Now I want to uh, go on to Soster just in a couple of slides. And again, I have found that people mix up Zoster and Simplex so badly. Zoster is the reactivation of um, varicella Zoster or the chickenpox virus. And usually it's in the elderly, there is a vaccine available and uh, we should avail ourselves, uh, you know, when we get a bit older. So early treatment, when uh, the paresthesia starts uh, uh, and the pain fol uh, followed by vesicles, the earlier you start with high dose uh, acyclovir uh, for a few days, the, you can change the course of the disease and also you can reduce the risk uh, of uh, post-hepatic neuralgia as well, which can be very severe and very prolonged the older you are. Epithelial disease is of little consequence. So some tips on uh, HZO. Be careful, uh, people who might become pregnant and who have not had chicken pox before can catch chicken pox from uh, herpes zoster patients and then threaten uh, the uh, baby. Uh, and um, it could be a presentation of HIV uh, in young patients. So uh, ask for an HIV test. Remember, you can get trabeculitis and the eye pressure can be very high. So let's not be lazy and let's measure the uh, intraocular pressure. Check the fundus as well because the retina can be affected and it can be life-threatening uh, in immunocompromised states. And there can be some uh, neurological complications uh, uh, and things like uh, ascending angiitis as well. Now, with a post-hepatic 
uh, UV light is, it actually lasts for a very, very long time. So you need to keep them on uh, one drop of steroid uh, for months, if not uh, a small number of years. So when uh, Lotamax is available, I would use that. Uh, if not, then maybe softer court. If you taper off or stop too quickly, then uh, the zoster uveitis will return. We've already talked about neuralgia, uh, early diagnosis and treatment is good. And if it's really bad, then you need to give psychological support and consider um, using medications like garbapentin uh, and carbamazepin. Uh, Dr. Sinjet, what is the time, please? Um, we still have 13 minutes. 13? Yes. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, adenovirus, uh, it's best left untreated uh, if the patient can function. Uh, the treatment is with topical steroids, but the tapering uh, needs to be very gradual. And here you see an example uh, of uh, nominal keratitis. You can make it disappear, uh, but if you uh, stop the steroid, then it will come back. So that's why you need to taper very gradually. If you don't need to use that eye, uh, uh, if it's asymmetric uh, or if it's only a lateral disease, then maybe it's best to just let nature uh, deal with it. Uh, of course, it takes longer for, for it to clear, but then you don't need the steroid. Okay, one That's slide on chemical yeah. injury, uh, which will be covered by uh, Dr. Nancy in a few weeks' time. Just three key points, immediate and adequate irrigation. Something that people sometimes forget is to evert the lids, sometimes double evert to re remove particulate matter. And early intense steroid therapy is very, very important. So uh, we move on to uh, limbal stem cells. I will try and gallop as, as fast as I can. Uh, slides courtesy of uh, Alex Short and Sain Basu. And here you have a young lady who had her mobile phone uh, stolen uh, and uh, she was attacked with uh, chemicals, thankfully just to one eye. So in the acute phase, this is what it looks like. And it is better to see uh, a red eye than a white eye, as you know. Later on, uh, because of significant limbal stem cell deficiency, conjunctival type epithelium has grown in uh, and with superficial vascularization, unstable epithelium, so discomfort, reduced vision. And here is uh, where the uh, limbal stem cells live in the uh, crypts and um, they go uh, forward and upwards. If there are not enough uh, limbal stem cells, then you will get this sort of um, results. So here we have one eye normal, the other eye like this. What you can do is to move some limbal stem cells across. The original uh, Kenyan and Zeng um, uh, technique uh, takes two strips from here and here uh, and move to the other eye and then cells uh, grow from there. So here you can see a, a successful result using the uh, traditional technique. However, this is uh, used less and less because now what we can do is to take a small sample from the good eye uh, of the limbus uh, and then uh, digest that in the laboratory uh, and then it will grow in the laboratory to a layer of cells which can then be transplanted. This is actually commercially available, it's called Holoclar, uh, but it's frightfully expensive. So the outcomes are good. However, the majority of cases are bilateral. That is the problem. So for example, uh, our ocular service um, failure uh, from Stevens johnson syndrome, aniridia, mucous membrane pemphigoid, and uh, other things. And there's a huge difference in outcomes between autographs and allografts. Now with allografts, you, you need to uh, use um, systemic uh, or topical uh, uh, immunosuppression. And uh, also there might be uh, uh, more, they might be more complicated clinically and more complex pathologically. And I've already talked about the rejection. So more complicated clinically because the primary disease may still be present. There may be persistent inflammation, abnormal lids, abnormal tears, and other ocular pathologies. You can see here some blepharon, um, non-lid closure. 
Pathologically, again, the primary pathology may still be present, may, may be present and persistent inflammation. And if the damage to the limbal niche uh, has happened, then when you transplant uh, stem cells, can they um, survive or not? Risk of rejection through antigen presenting cells going to your local uh, lymph node or thymus and coming back as T cells uh, attacking uh, the allograft. So essentially, this is um, Dr. Palarama's um, algorithm that if you've got simple limbal stem cell deficiency, then you just do the reconstruction uh, as shown in the previous slides. But if it's complicated, you do actually need to reconstruct these bit by bit uh, in order for the uh, limbus uh, to work well. There is an alternative. Uh, if people cannot afford the uh, holoclar, what you can do is to take limbus and uh, chop it up into small uh, bits like seeds. And then uh, you can uh, just put a contact lens on and, and let it grow. And this is uh, invented by um, Ferenda Sangwin and uh, Sian Basu. So here you see, um, a limbal stem cell division is quite severe. Uh, and then um, putting uh, some fibrin and um, amniotic membrane. And then here's a strip of limbus and then it's um, scattered everywhere with a little bit of fibrin. And then um, distributed and uh, stuck. And then you can see that um, cells uh, grow from these seeds and eventually uh, form a complete layer. And here you can see uh, some of the results and these are the abnormal eyes and this is the abnormal eye and you can see uh, post-op <coughs> after SLET, that's great in clinical improvement. And here is um, one uh, of many uh, SLET publications. Um, so uh, collagen cross-linking, you will have um, a talk on this. And essentially, uh, the original technique is to remove the epithelium, a uh, soak with riboflavin. Uh, it, the purpose is to uh, increase the rigidity of corneostroma, and the indications are keratoconus, post-laser keratectasia, uh, and the corneal ulcers. And this one is not dependent on oxygen and is not effective for fungal infection. You hear about uh, all this. So the procedure talking about remove uh, epithelium uh, and the riboflavin soaks and it acts as a photosensitizer to create free radicals when exposed to UVA. But it also absorbs uh, uh, UV uh, rays uh, to reduce the risk of damage to deep ocular tissues like the endothelium lens uh, and further within. And it is said the free radicals will cross-link the collagen lamellae, but actually the uh, mechanism is not uh, really known. Contraindications you know about, um, thin cornea uh, during pregnancy, uh, very steep cornea. Uh, uh, older patients, no need to cross-link because our corneas are already naturally cross-linked. We've already talked about the Dresden protocol, which is very prolonged. And the variations are more intensive ultraviolet for short term and equally effective epithelial on or epithelial disruption as opposed to removal, iontophoresis, a hyperosmolar riboflavin to swell thin cornea uh, and other cross-linking agents. It is highly efficacious uh, and can be uh, combined with intracorneal strings, uh, uh, rings. Now the corneal flattening occurs typically some months or a year later. The complications, uh, loss of best corrected visual acuity, haze, uh, infectious keratitis, and sometimes the flattening can be progressive uh, over a number of years. So that is why in yellow here, this is my real message to you, that except in children, uh, document progression after cessation of eye rubbing before considering uh, cross-thinking. Again, I see people, uh, with an adult coming in and they say, well, you've got to have come from this point from somewhere, so you've already progressed, so uh, let's uh, cross-link you straight away. 
Now, if you don't stop the itch and stop them rubbing, then even after cross linking, it is still uh, going to progress. So it's really important. Uh, this is my main message about cross linking. One um, slide on eye banking, just to say that I have asked many people and Islam permits eye donation and the sclera and cornea can be used for transplantation and equally donated tissues may be used for surgical training and research. History taking of the diseased donor and blood tests taken postmortem reduce the risk of disease transmission, uh, including prions. You have two sorts of uh, eye bags, cold storage in a medium at four degrees uh, allows storage for about one week and organ culture uh, at 34 degrees around one month. And the quality control uh, includes a cell count, sometimes a picture of the epithelium, cell morphology and blood results. However, it is still possible to miss previous surgery, uh, such as cataract surgery uh, uh, or um, keratoconus um, can be missed. Uh, uh, and previous character refractive surgery can also be missed. Now, eye banks are increasingly doing pre-cut desache and pre-peeled DMAC tissues. And it's important to do corneal graft um, uh, audit to know what sort of results we're getting. Corneal transplantation, just some tips on three slides. Here you see a penetrating keratoplasty PK or in American PKP with lots of sutures. We're moving away from that. And the reason is we, if we replace uh, only the layer or layers, uh, which is our disease or scar, then you're reducing antigen load. And if you're uh, keeping the host endothelium, then you're not going to get um, immunological rejection. And if you're keeping some uh, of the host tissue, you're going to reduce astigmatism. So we've already talked about limbal stem cell transplantation. There's talk of Bowman transplantation to stabilize keratoconus. Stromal transplantation, mainly DALC. This is what we're talking about, uh, leaving the endothelium. And endothelial transplantation, DZAC uh, or DMEC. And uh, I will also tell you uh, a little bit about keratoprosthesis. So DALC retains host endothelium. Remember one thing, this is what I really want to tell you, that the pre-decimase layer is physically very strong. So if you keep that, rather than try and remove it, then you're onto a good thing. And it doesn't um, decrease your visual acuity very much. The second point I want to tell you about is if you have small breaks or even largest breaks on decimase membrane, then do not convert to PK because it, it is still better to keep the patient's own endothelium. And here uh, we explain uh, why and how it's done. DMAC, just one slide, it's a very steep learning curve, but you can practice with wet labs and it is worthwhile. It gives you the best visual quality and it's a very rapid rehabilitation with very little refractive change. DMAC also can be used to reline a failing penetrating corneal graft, and uh, it works miraculously. So say, for example, if you've already got a toric implant, uh, which matches your uh, penetrating keratoplasty, but the penetrating keratoplasty is failing, then you just need to reline it, and you don't have to worry about the uh, implant not being suitable anymore. And the rejection rate is almost zero uh, if you stay on one drop of steroid per day. So finally, um, my um, real specialism of uh, keratoprosthesis, just a few slides on this and then we close. Why do we need a keratoprosthesis? It is to restore sight in corneal blindness, which is not amenable to conventional keratoplasty. So mainly these are very dry eyes, keratinized eyes, and a uh, defective uh, lid or blink uh, or um, multiple previous graft failure uh, or a highly vascularized um, cornea, which um, if you put a, a graft on, um, conventional cornea graft is uh, bound to fail. So keratoprosthesis uh, bypass uh, ocular surface in the host cornea. It is very much a last resort 
and it is not uh, something to be taken lightly. So first, do no harm, and uh, it's important to discuss all the options, including the option of uh, no treatment. Full informed consent is very important. It, is, it needs to be the patient who wants the operation, knowing what it involves, and not the doctor wanting to do the operation. A holistic approach is important, means that it's not just the eye, but you have to deal with the body and mind of the patient, and uh, also the family as well, include everybody. And never forget the supporting measures such as serum tears, tasography, scleral contact lenses, which can be vault vaulted and uh, made to fit any corneal shape. And it can keep the epithelium hydrated. And sometimes that is already in enough um, sight improvement to uh, avert the need for keratoprosthesis. Always wait for the inflammation to settle uh, otherwise, uh, the graft uh, may not take. So which keratoprosthesis then? There are two main keratoprosthesis uh, in action. So for wet blinking eyes with no bulb or tarsal keratin, then the choice would be um, Austin K-Pro type 1, which can last uh, up to a few years uh, and does less well with autoimmune diseases. Now for the dry eye uh, and uh, with lid defect and complete blink, then the choice device is the OKP when done with the patient's own canine tooth and it can last uh, 10 or 20 years. And here you see a Boston type one and you can see uh, a post-op uh, OKP and the cross-sectional anatomy. Uh, it's a very severe surgical program. So when, uh, bilateral corneal blindness or an uh, only eye, only remaining eye, because sometimes when patients come and see me for carriage prosthesis, they have already lost one eye. They need to have a strong wish to regain sight. We've already talked about uh, informed consent. They must understand of the inherent instability of all character prosthesis. Even the OKP is uh, less stable than an intact normal eye. They must be psychologically robust with family support and they must be prepared for lifelong uh, regular follow-up and further procedures. Alternatives to keratoprosthesis, cell-based therapy can be an alternative in a wet blinking eye, but not in a dry eye. Now, in a dry keratinized eye where there is no suitable tooth, alternatives have much reduced longevity. So the patient should not proceed if they're not prepared for a reduced uh, span uh, of uh, sight restoration. And these are the possible alternatives. So I think for summary for keratoprosthesis, uh, for patients who can accept navigational vision, COMET, which is uh, transplanting uh, mouth uh, epithelium onto the eye surface, can avoid immunosuppression and complications of keratoprosthesis surgery. Boston Capro type 1 surgery gives instantaneous gratification, but complications can come sometimes quite soon, sometimes later on, uh, especially when performed in off-piece cases. In other, words, in other words, not the wet blinking eyes with no keratin. The OKP lasts much longer, but only with a good lamina made from the patient's own canine. Cell therapy or Boston K Pro type 1 will not work in a hostile ocular environment. And all the above, including Boston K Pro type 1, should only be offered at regional and national specialist centers. So I go back to my one of my first slides that knowledge, experience and mentorship really important and um, find yourself a, a good mentor or a number of mentors and that can really help your way. And remember, um, learning is a, a lifelong thing and um, I, I'm still learning despite my um, relative old age. So I acknowledge people who have given me material and I acknowledge uh, my um, past fellows and uh, Nancy is here. So thank you, Nancy, for working with me and introducing me uh, to Dr. Sinjab. And here are my email addresses for anybody uh, who wish to uh, contact me. Thank you very much, Christopher, for this wonderful overview, comprehensive, scientific, and very simple. Actually, we have been enjoying listening to you and we would love listening to you till morning. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Um, very nice lecture, actually. Uh, very nice tips and uh, guidelines. Um, you established a lot of uh, uh, guidelines, actually. Now, I would love to, I would like to take two questions, important questions. The first one is, whenever we don't have, in some areas, we don't have an access to, to do the technology, um, like to, to diagnose the fungal keratitis. For example, we don't have an access to the lab laboratory in some areas, for example. Can we apply antifungal treatment depending on suspicion only, or depending on the uh, presentation of the sleep lamp? Uh, what do you think? Mm. I think um, in, in countries where there's more fungal keratitis, I'm sure people uh, gain uh, much more uh, acumen and um, experience. <laughs> I actually see very, very few uh, fungal keratitis. So in a way, I'm not the person to ask, uh, but clinical appearance is usually not very useful, but if um, there is nothing else, then that's all we have to go by. And we can only do uh, try our best for patients. That's all we can do. And nobody can ask more uh, than that of us. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question is, uh, what's your opinion about bivudine tablet in the treatment of herpes zoster as an alternative to aciclovir? This is a question from Amr. Thank you very much. You will need to give me time. I have not experienced that at all. So um, if, if, you, if you drop me a line, then I, I will um, have a look and then um, let you have my um, uh, opinion. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Nancy, please. Yeah. Um, good evening. Yeah, thank you, Christopher, for um, this very comprehensive. Um, actually, you reminded me uh, why I have chose you as my mentor, and I'm uh, still proud of this and uh, talking about this everywhere I go. So uh, enjoyed it. Uh, as if uh, I was a fellow, you took me like uh, years back. Uh, not that I mean that you're old, no. Uh, you're still as young as, as I met you. Um, <laughs> We enjoyed uh, this talk, really. It's comprehensive and uh, covered uh, most of the aspects, actually, and it's really capturing. So uh, what I want to add is, um, uh, or uh, maybe a answer. I remember when I came back from UK after uh, um, finishing my fellowship, I tried to uh, implement uh, all the guidelines I used to uh, follow in UK to Jordan. And uh, sometimes, unfortunately, because of there are so many variations in, in, in the nature of the people, the nature of how even the doctors are dealing with, with diseases that we cannot apply all uh, 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 guidelines. And one of, the, one of the things that I wanna talk about is the fungal keratitis. Now uh, in UK, I remember that it's a taboo uh, and an and antibiotic uh, that could be uh, prescribed. In our countries or uh, around uh, our area, it's over the counter. So there's, there's a misuse of antibiotics. And uh, a lot of times we get uh, polymicrobial infections. Um, sometimes it's not possible to be, uh, uh, act, there uh, won't be access to immediate or um, uh, comprehensive or uh, uh, reliable uh, laboratory uh, results. So we have to rely on clinical judgment in, in uh, uh, managing people. And this is, this is really important when we um, manage uh, patients that come from rural areas, they're not ready to come back for, uh, uh, for uh, frequent visits or uh, we have to hospitalize them. If we don't see a response in like uh, 72, uh, 96 hours, we have to rule out uh, fungal keratitis and we start sometimes bombarding them with antifungal treatment. And if we see um, uh, some improvement, we just go on. Sometimes the laboratory results, they come after 10 days and we cannot just wait while we're seeing the, the, the condition deteriorating. So it's kind of, we have to, kick in some of our common sense and clinical experience in dealing with such cases in order to see. Uh, uh, and then we, we taper and tailor things according to what the labs come uh, back with. So this is one of the things maybe um, to just individualize how we deal with these uh, 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 kind of patients according to our circumstances. Um, and this is uh, my comment about that uh, particular subject, actually. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Um, I have a question. Thank you, Dr. Nancy, for this input. Uh, I have a question to Christopher. Yes. Um, what do you think of starting with the punctal plug in the upper punctum rather than the lower punctum? But of course, not from the beginning, because we have to control the inflammatory process very well mm. before we, mm. we go for the punctal plug. But um, what do you think about putting it in the upper rather than the, the lower one? Okay, well, I think people use the uh, lower puncture because we, we know that uh, they drain 70% of the tears, uh, whereas the upper ones only drain 30. So I think it's likely to be more effective. But you know, with puncture plugs, you still get tears go around the puncture plugs and they're not as, as effective as cautery. But you have to try that first because, I mean, the last thing you want is to do something and then there is too much watering, you know, then, then they hate you for it. Very good, thank you. Uh, why I'm asking this, because actually, um, let's say maybe since a year, I switched to putting the punctal plug in the upper one, just to see if it gives the same effect. And actually it does. And really? uh, people, mm. yeah, and, and people are more comfortable than the lower one more comfortable, they, they don't mm. feel it. But mm. however, it has a higher rate of, um, let's say, extrusion or okay. it, it falls down more, more than the lower one. Okay, so, yeah. so maybe, maybe you have to make it tighter. So, you know, try and squeeze yes. a bigger one, in, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yes, yeah, thank but, you very much. I mean, I think this experience is worth, is worth writing up so that people know about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Pleasure. So I think uh, everything is clear now and we have, we don't have, ah, uh, there is a question whether we can use the cyclosporine for the adenosubepithelial infiltrate treatment. What do you think, Christopher and Nancy? Well, I haven't been able to answer any of your questions really. They're so difficult. I think I'll let Dr. Nancy answer it, I think. <laughs> Oh, this is so humble of you, actually. So uh, let me just uh, restate uh, the question again. What about the cyclosporine drops for the adenoviral precipitase? Is this the question? Yes. Um, yeah, actually, um, I don't use it that much. Most of the patients that come with uh, adenoviral precipitase, um, they have been treated elsewhere and they come to me as a referral. Uh, steroids is the main state of treatment in the acute stage. Um, we have been see seeing... Um, adenoviral precipitates that are uh, resistant to treatment over the past few months. They came as a crop of uh, infection and they were resistant to steroids. And as uh, Mr. Lou said, um, the moment you step steroids, they just flare up. It's very important not to stop abruptly. It's very important to taper the steroid. And at some stage, uh, it might flare up even if you are on steroids for like once a day. So you go up and uh, top it up. Um, one thing which is I'm using, and this is off the record, I've, I'm working on publishing this, is the use of acyclovir, systemic acyclovir for resistant and chronic uh, um, uh, adenoviral precipitates. Like um, if a precipitate is going over three months and it's not uh, 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 going away or fading away, I use uh, adenoviral, uh, I use uh, acyclovir 400 by two, which is only the maintenance dose of uh, um, acyclovir. And it works magic, um, actually. And the moment I just sometimes stop it or the patients reduce it, it comes and flare ups again. So this is what I've been working on. And it's working very well for my patients. A -cycl um, uh, cyclosporin is not doing uh, a lot. So uh, most of the time I stop it when the patients come to me. I don't use it as a first line of treatment, no. It's the steroids. And then if it's chronic, I use the acyclovir. Yeah. Thank you very much. So by this, we conclude this uh, uh, very nice meeting and very nice lecture from Christopher. I'd like to thank you, Christopher, and thank Nancy, and hope to see you then in the next meeting, uh, which will be after Eid, inshallah. And I would like to thank uh, everybody for being with us. Uh, by the way, many people are following the uh, live streaming on the YouTube as well. So uh, thanks to all and good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. See you soon. Bye. Bye.